Friends, good evening. Welcome everyone to our first chamber lecture series. Tonight, we are going to start our seminar on magic with elementals. We're going to learn a little bit about elemental magic. We're going to learn about how to work with the elemental advocate. We're going to learn a little bit about elementals and we're going to do this in the span of the next couple of months. The evolution of the elementals is what allows us to work with the elementals themselves for the sake of bringing healing. And this happens because monads, essences, consciousnesses, they progress in waves. All of these monads emerge from the bosom of the Absolute whenever the law dictates that it is their time. And as that happens, they descend into the realms where they correspond based on their level of being. So monads evolve and devolve. A good example of those monads are us humanoid creatures. Because when we emerged from the bosom of the Absolute, as we emerged and we were able to reach the realm in which corresponded our existence, and we have an opportunity to experience our first physical body, well, we started within the Mineral Kingdom. And we made some progressions that perhaps we can speak about them later, eventually got to this humanoid state, and if we do not make a change... If we do not bring an additional level of energy into this particular effort so that we can take a leap onto the other side, well, as a monad, we will devolve. And provided that we consume all of the lives that we have been granted, if we don't do anything useful with those existences, we will return into the bosom of the absolute as an elemental with no mastery, no mastery. But all of these elemental atoms characterize themselves because they are not void of intelligence. There is intelligence and there is wisdom in everything that exists. And what brings about that breath of life into all of creation is the essence of prana. Prana is life. Prana is uh, that, that fundamental energy that exists in, in everything in the vastness in the, of the universe. And it exists in the suns and in the galaxies as much as it exists within the infinitesimal sizes of the atom. Oh, speaking about the evolution of the elementals. There is a mistake, some confusions that have, that, that have emerged because of the wrong interpretation of the ancient Eastern wisdom. We know that it is not a true statement that all of us already have our superior existential bodies. It is not true that everybody has their physical, vital, astral, mental, causal, buddhic, and body of Atman. That is not true. These are bodies that we must fabricate. Just as it is not true that the law of evolution eventually is going to take us to some threshold that we are going to be able to naturally progress through by virtue of just the mechanical forces of nature, and that we are going to acquire a heightened degree of illumination. That will not happen just by virtue of the mechanical laws of nature. This is the mistake of many theosophists and the mistake of many Rosicrucians. As a monad, we were able to learn about stability. We were, we were able to learn about transmutation and alchemy when we were all part of the mineral kingdom. But eventually, we reached a degree of mastery in the, in, the, in the mineral kingdom that allowed us to take a leap and transcend into the plant kingdom. So then we were in the plant kingdom, and it is there where we experienced our first individuality. Now, we were not just sharing a physical form with thousands of other monads. Now, in the plant kingdom, we are responsible for a body that is a little bit more complex. Now, this body 
that we were given did not have the ability to displace itself. It did not have the ability to experience emotions as we know them today. But that first individuality gave us the opportunity to experience what it is to serve as a microcosmos to hundreds of thousands, to millions of other monads. And as we progress through the elemental kingdom, we gain through the elemental kingdom of the plants, the plant kingdom, we had the opportunity to learn everything that they that we needed to learn as a divine soul of the functions, the capabilities, the capacities of all of those plants. The day arrived where we achieved mastery. And we were able to take then a leap into the animal kingdom. And once we got into the animal kingdom, not only we had already experienced already individuality, now we were able to experience motility, displace ourselves. And in addition to that, we were able to experience a new set of sensations and perceptions. We went through different incarnations throughout different levels of the animal kingdom. And the moment that we achieve mastery in the kingdom, we propelled into the next one. And in this next kingdom, our Divine Mother gave us the opportunity to receive a human body. That does not mean that because we have a human body, we are humans. We are still an elemental animal in a human body, but different than when we were in the raw animal kingdom. Back there, we learned to experience emotion. Here, we have learned to elaborate concept. And because we have elaborated concept, well, now we make use of our senses in ways that are different than those in the animal kingdom. For example, now, based on our level of being and our current state of degeneration, well, we will perversely make use of some sensations and abuse of them just to satisfy some desires and impulses that are all part of our own psychological aggregates. Eventually, the opportunities that we are given in this humanoid kingdom are going to end. The cosmic laws will eventually continue bringing us back and we will have so many opportunities. And if we do not take advantage of this body, the creative energies that exist with it, within it, the ability to transmute those energies so that we can learn to fabricate the bodies that we're going to need in subsequent kingdoms, well, we're going to remain stuck. And we are going to extenuate those lives and the laws of nature are not going to have any other option than allow us to descend into the inferior realms of the earth so that the catabolic forces of nature themselves can destroy all of those inferior inhumane creations. So here we are. In the body of a human, still an elemental animal, but able to make use of forces that are superior to the mind. Forces that we can use to transform ourselves, to regenerate the body, to renew the body, to reinvigorate the body. But this requires of an internal transvalorization. An internal transvaluation. Fortunately, we are in a period where these esoteric schools of regeneration are in activity. The activity of all of these schools of regeneration is ruled by the Archon of the planet Neptune. This great archangel will allow for something in the vicinity of 165 years of activity for these schools. So, there are around 165 years of activity, and after that is done, well, then the, the schools of mysteries, they retreat, and they go into a period of rest, where the wisdom continues to be taught, but not 
publicly as we are experiencing it today. We are fortunate enough that we have our hands in this trove of wisdom, in this divine treasure. And just if we did not do anything other than honor in gratefulness this opportunity, it would be then in our best interest to learn about how to work with that internal source of temptation. How to learn to steal the fire from those different ordeals that we must go through in life. To learn how to work intimately with our spouse in that super dynamic of love so that we can effectively transform and create the bodies that are necessary so that we can take the leap onto the other side. We have that ability as elemental animals with a human body. But there are leads, leaders, guiders of all of these elemental forces of nature. Many teachings of this have been given in the ancient schools of mysteries. And speaking about the ancient school of Egyptian mysteries, the elemental sphinx is the body of our divine goddess, Mother Nature. That is the second aspect of our divine mother. The great Osiris, that representation of the cosmic Christ, and Aurus, symbol of our innermost, well... They were seen as elemental gods of ancient Egypt. And when we speak of Indra, Agni, Pavana, Varuna, Kitichi, these are elemental gods. All of these divine beings, all of these powerful masters, are masters who chose the spiral path. Those masters on the vertical path, path like the one Samael has embarked, well, these are masters that go through tremendous ordeals. They go through tremendous sufferings, but it is the direct path into the absolute. All of those masters who embrace this direct path are known as Buddhas Maitreyas. They're Buddhas of compassion. They always come back to help humanities. But then there are also those masters who don't choose the vertical path. They choose a spiral path that still has ordeals, still has difficulties, but the sufferings are much less. And as they make their progression in that spiral path, eventually they start reaching levels of being that empowers them to assume ownership and responsibility for things like elemental kingdoms of nature. So we have Indra. Indra is the god of the ether. And in the ether, we know that we have elemental creatures. These elementals, well, they are known as elementals because they are fundamental, basic, rudimentary aspects, manifestations of that moment. And the elementals of the ether are known as puntas and barbellas. And then there is Agni, the god of fire. Agni has control and dominion over all that environment in which the salamanders of fire manifest. And the salamanders of fire are the elementals of fire. Pavana is the god of air. Well, he rules over all the sylphs and sylphids of air. Varuna, he has dominion over the undines, the nereids. Undines in all of those bodies of fresh water. And the nereids in all of those bodies of salty waters. And then we have Kitichi the elemental god of the element of earth. And he has dominion over all the, the gnomes and pygmies of the earth. Of the three types of gnomes and pygmies that exist, from the 
from the most unexperienced monads to the monads with the highest mastery capable of exercising alchemy, transmutation of metals and elements. And every sincere practitioner has the ability to work with elementals. We must make it very clear that the elementals do not just respond to those masters of the White Lodge. Uh, they also respond to those who are awakened in darkness and for darkness. Because the elemental, in their longing, all they are seeking is to serve all that they are seeking to do is to learn, to put to practice everything that they have been learning in their kingdom. And they will respond to the commands that are given to them by either a tenebrous entity or by someone who is working to awaken in the light or from a master of enlightenment. And these monads, these elementals, just as we have experienced plenty of suffering in our existences, they can also experience suffering. For example, somebody grabs a plant and they tear it and, and tear, it, uh, tear its branches or its leaves or harm the plant in any way. That creates terror in the elemental. That creates anger in the elemental. And it affects the elemental in its own psychology, even affecting the ability of the elemental itself to heal. So, knowing that these creatures are just seeking to serve, well, creatures of darkness and masters of the light both work with elementals. But we're not going to focus on the creatures of darkness. As this seminar unfolds, we're going to even learn how to work with elementals so that we can protect ourselves from those creatures of darkness. Focusing then on the aspect of the light. We know that we have disciples and we know that we have masters, adepts. We have perfect masters and we have masters of perfection. Every sincere disciple who has the ability to work with the elementals, they must realize that they must work with the elemental one at a time. A great master who has already received the wings of the spirit, a master who has gone through initiations of major mysteries, who already has its flaming sword, well, they can un uh, unsheath their sword and they can command millions of elementals simultaneously and those elementals will respond to the instructions of that master simply because the fact that they already have their flaming sword indicates that they have been faithful to the will of the Father. That they are not operating out of desire or fear or anger or any of the other inhumane aspects that we have. But because they have been following the will of the Father and they have received that degree of mastery, they are empowered with dominion over those forces of nature. Yes, they can do that. But as disciples, we are not there yet. And in many cases, many of us are not even disciples. We are aspirants to becoming disciples. I mean, if after 10 or 15 years we're not meditating on a daily basis, if we don't do mantras, if we don't practice the runes, if we don't do retrospection, if, if we don't have that esoteric discipline, how could we consider ourselves disciples? There will be a moment in which you will know that you are indeed a disciple and we will speak about the gift that you will receive for that at the end of this lesson. But those who are disciples, they must work with one elemental at a time. And if the disciples have to work with one elemental at a time, then needless to say, the same thing applies to us. This means that if you are involved with some magic of nature to bring healing, uh, 
Or if you're working with some elementals for the sake of bringing protection or etc. We have to work with each elemental individually. And that translates to us being diligent enough to follow a process where we invoke always the innermost, we ask the innermost to invoke of our Divine Mother Nature, the second aspect of our Divine Mother Kundalini, we ask of her of permission so that we can work with an internal aspect of the being that is known as the Elemental Advocate. And once we have received that permission, we will ask the elemental advocate to do the work with that elemental. We will speak a little bit about the elemental advocate. Because this is a very, very interesting subject matter. Samael tells us, He who receives the sword of justice has the power to command his elemental advocate and to make it visible to his disciples as to protect them from the tenebrous ones. Please don't forget this. If at any moment you needed protection against tenebrous entities, we can always invoke the elemental advocate because the elemental advocate is an integral part of our being. It is one, <clears throat> excuse me, of those 49 parts of the being. But what is this thing, the elemental advocate? I mean, if it's a part of the being and it's there and we can work with it, well, how did the elemental advocate came to be? Well, the elemental advocate was created by each and every one of us speaking to the consciousness. The elemental advocate was created by each and every one of us from the moment that you started in the mineral kingdom. As that monad is acquiring mastery, that elemental advocate, part of our being, learned everything that there was to be learned about the mineral kingdom. As you as an elemental transition into the plant kingdom, that elemental advocate, because your consciousness is in direct communication and contact with the innermost, the experience of the consciousness is shared with the elemental advocate in such a way that the elemental advocate learns everything that there is to learn about capabilities, capacities, abilities, powers of all the plants in the plant kingdom. As you walk into the animal kingdom, the elemental advocate then learns everything that must be learned about the abilities and capacities of all the creatures within the animal kingdom. So your elemental advocate is a master in elemental therapy. This elemental advocate has been growing on pair, parallel, with the consciousness, as the consciousness has been going through all of these experiences. But of course, if we disconnect from the innermost, because we suffer this philosophical and scientific curse that has been being expelled from paradise, if we committed the sin of, of the Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, well, that disconnection from the animals also disconnected the consciousness from the elemental advocate. And we're saying disconnected here in, in, in a colloquial way, because the innermost has always been there for us. Those of you who have been in these studies long enough, well, you have invoked of the innermost and you have worked with the innermost enough to know that the innermost is here and now. And that we have incarnated an aspect of the innermost that is a fraction of its human soul. So we know this. But because we have been caught in the ego, because we have fractioned our consciousness in such a way that it has ended up trapped in so many distinct and individual psychological aggregates, well, we have turned a blind eye to the elemental advocate. And it has been there all along, but we have not worked with it. Perhaps... In tens or dozens of years, or perhaps in many centuries, perhaps in millions of years. 
But the Elemental Advocate is here. And it is a master in Elemental Therapy. And we can refer to it as the Elemental Advocate. We can also refer to it as the Elemental Intercessor. Those of you who speak Spanish, well, you will, you will hear it, that when we invoke it in Spanish, we ask for the elemental intercessor, el intercesor elemental. In English, well, we have a little bit more fluidity with the language, so we can also call it the elemental advocate. So even if you know nothing, nothing about any specific ritual to do with a plant, Even if you do not know the words of power that are necessary to liberate the magic of the plant, you can always ask your innermost to invoke the elemental advocate, to bring forth the elemental advocate, and to ask the elemental advocate to be the one practicing the ritual, because it knows. You can ask the elemental advocate to be the one singing the mantras, doing the salutations, performing all the necessary actions to liberate the magic of which this or that elemental is capable. And in terms of healing, we can ask the elemental of the plant through the elemental advocate to link itself to the organ of the person who is in need of the healing. And once healed, well, we then ask for the liberation Of the elemental so that the elemental can continue with its work so that it can continue with its own development and that it can continue making the necessary process progress there is a very beautiful prayer that exists in one of the rituals of the second chamber there's a ritual of second degree in which there's an invocation of the divine mother And the evocation reads, Hail Newt, eternal cosmic Sadie. Hail Newt, light of the heavens. Hail Newt, primordial and unique soul. And then there is the singing of a very powerful mantra. E -a -o. We mentioned this. Because we must adore our Divine Mother. And men, when we look at our wife, we must adore our wife knowing that she is a physical representation of that Divine, Eternal, Feminine Principle. If we look at our wife, or any woman, with morbidity, with perverseness, We are tainting that relationship with the Divine Mother. We cannot possibly expect to behave in such an inferior way out there and look at women as if they were objects of pleasure and if they were there to please us, etc., in very inferior ways. And then think for an instant that we can come back here and imagine ourselves tracing a magical circle and invoking our Divine Mother and expecting the magic to work. We must remember that we get out of all of these practices exactly what we bring into them. And now that we are at this level of study, at the intermediate level, We have to start expanding our practice beyond the lecture, beyond the few minutes of mantras or the few minutes of meditation. We have to start seeing every day as a new round in this internal work. We have to start seeing life itself, exactly like Samael says, as the path of initiation. So from the moment that you open your eyes in the morning to know that at that moment you have already started this internal esoteric work. 
And the moment that you close your eyes at night, to know that even though your body is going to sleep, as your soul emerges and remains within the astral plane, that that work continues, that that is also part of the path. It is time for us to realize that everything counts, that everything is important. Because when we do this, we start observing ourselves in a way that is a little different. Then we start really observing how we think, how we feel, how we behave. Then we start truly observing our habits. And all of this starts giving us the right degree of comprehension that is necessary to work with our Divine Mother so that she can help us liberating the consciousness by bringing of her sacred fire and reducing to our cosmic dust these aggregates that have kept us bound to this wheel of samsara and this realm of dense substance for so long. The more we love our Divine Mother Kundalini, Man, the more you love your wife, your sister, your mother, the person who works at the cashier at the supermarket, and you see in all of them a living representation of the Divine Mother, of that eternal feminine principle, the stronger becomes our ability to connect with those superior universal forces, particularly the wisdom and the intelligence of the Cosmic Christ. The more veneration and respect we exercise for them, that is the more veneration and respect that we are exercising for our own Divine Mother, for our own innermost. And of course, descending into our own infernos becomes easier. Because now, she knows that we are grateful children. But let's speak about the elemental advocate. The elemental advocate is a deva of nature. The elemental advocate knows all of this wisdom. The elemental advocate needs to integrate itself with the innermost as well. And this elemental advocate appears in many mysterious ways throughout the sacred scriptures. In the Gospels, in that narrative of the cosmic drama where the great master Yeshua looks at Peter, Patar, the great master advocate of the work of, of, of the super dynamic of love, he tells him, you will deny me three times. And Peter says, no, that's impossible. I will never do that. But not too much after, he is confronted by some Roman guards and somebody within the crowd points at him and says, He is one. He is one of them who knows him. And that is enough to bring so much fear within Peter that when the guards ask him, Do you know this man? Peter responds, No, I don't. I don't know who that is. I don't know what you're talking about. The elemental advocate is the one that awakens Peter from that lethargy. It is the elemental advocate, the one who brings the shock of consciousness into Peter so that he can emerge from within that abysmal darkness in which he is submerged to continue with his work. And we see this elemental advocate in the shape of a rooster. This is the Abaraxas of the ancient Gnostics. The Abaraxas of the ancient Gnostics shows a rooster rather than having two legs like a rooster, two feet like a rooster, it has two serpents. 
identical to the siukuat that we see in the stone of the sun. You would remember the two serpents that come and face each other. This rooster is gallo. In Spanish, gallo is rooster. And notice how the name of God is veiled within gallo. Here we find the e a o of the great mysteries of the super dynamic of love. This rooster crows three times. And that is enough to shock the consciousness of Peter. Of course, this is part of a cosmic drama. The lives of the masters are always lived in symbols. And that means that there is a teachable point for each and every one of us. This is saying that just as there is such a thing as the temptations of the masters, we cannot allow ourselves to fall into a false sense of security just because we are going to learn new things as part of our, uh, of our Gnostic culture. Just because we're going to have the ability to work with our innermost and the elemental advocate and work with forces of nature and eventually learn exercises of theurgy and work with angels and other divine masters. We cannot allow ourselves to fall into a space of complacency. Because the moment that we do, we lower our guard and the tenebrous ones never stop. They don't take vacation. We are the ones who think that we have to stop meditating after 30 minutes or an hour because we're getting too tired and we have too many things to do. But the tenebrous ones do not care about that. And they will take advantage of every possible opportunity and every weakness and vulnerability that you show to bring about challenges that will derail you from the effort. And that is in addition of the expected force of countertransference that will forever haunt you until we can eliminate up to the last remnant of the ego. As the practitioners continue to develop themselves, they will go through something that is called the test of the sanctuary. And in the test of the sanctuary, those who emerge successful after those ordeals, not important what those ordeals are at this moment, those who emerge victorious will receive a ring made of monadic substance. This ring will have a seal of Solomon, that six-pointed star. And that ring will be worn on the right index finger as an indication of becoming a true disciple. Those disciples will wear cloth of linen that is of a grayish nature. I would like to close our lecture tonight with some words of Master Samael. Samael says, speaking of the Gnostic doctor, the Gnostic doctor must learn to use his elementor intercessor to heal the sick. The Gnostic doctor must learn to manipulate the elemental substances of nature to heal. And with this, Samael is saying, we learn all, all these things, not just for us, we learn them for others. The service that we bring into others, combined with the ability to see and eliminate our psychological aggregates, with the constant quest to enable the will of the innermost inside of us, so that we can experience and become instruments of its virtues, its faculties, and its powers. You see, those three factors of the revolution of the consciousness, they always come together. And the more we work to heal others, the more we do for others, puts us in a situation that is very similar to what has been taught in the ancient Zen Buddhism for millennia. We don't work for today. We work for the next life. We're not doing things for now. We all do all this just for later. And in the same light, 
the healing, the benefit that we bring to others, the law will bring it back eventually to ourselves. We focus now on maintaining a strong posture so that we can follow the will of the innermost. Men, listen. Adore the woman. See in every woman a reflection of the divine, eternal, feminine principle. And with that, let's continue our week. When we come back, we will speak a little bit more about elementals and about the practice. So dear friends, this has been our lecture tonight. Therapy with Elementals, Part 1. Thank you everyone for being here with us this evening. And... May all beings be happy.